All right, welcome everybody to Yuma Center, where we are inspiring women and impacting generations. My name is Mary Ellen Yep, and I'm the program director at Yuma Center and your host tonight on the hill to the home in Washington, DC and across the United States and Canada. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, Yuma has been committed to providing donation-based programming during this pandemic. So for this event, Yuma teamed up with our partner at American Initiatives to give 50% of every registration donation to the ISSI School of Nursing in the Democratic Republic of Congo. With your help, we were able to send protective gear and disinfectants to both the nurses and to use as well for their patients during this pandemic. And we raised over $500. So that's a record for us at Yuma. So thank you so much for, for participating in that endeavor of ours. Before I introduce our speaker, I have about three little housekeeping notes for you. So at the bottom of your screen, of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little icon that says Q&A. So after our presentation, we will have a Q&A session where you click that icon and you can type in any question you want to, either anonymously or from you. The other housekeeping point I wanted to point out to you is that we are going to have a door prize at the end of this event. So stay tuned for the winner. And then um, before, again, we, before we introduce our speaker, I kind of wanted to gauge and see who we have in the audience tonight. So I'm going to send you a poll. So if you're looking straight at your Zoom screen, I'm gonna send you a poll to see what industry you're in. So I'll give you about a minute to click and then I will post the results. All right, I'll give you about 30 more seconds. There are a few other people who are still voting away. All right, so I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results. So the highest was education at 38%. For government and military, we had 12%. We had 12% for law. We had 8% that were family care provider or homemaker. We had 27% in healthcare or science. We have 8% um, in tech or cybersecurity, 4% in hospitality or travel. 8% in business finance or accounting, 8% in nonprofit, and then 4% in another industry that was not named. Well, thank you everyone for participating in that. Um, and now let me introduce our speaker, Beth Griffin. Beth Griffin leads MasterCard's healthcare vertical for artificial intelligence solutions within the cyber and intelligence team. Beth leads Healthcare Vertical to create new solutions to mitigate fraud, improve security, and enhance efficacy for the healthcare market. Building upon the healthcare payment solutions she previously managed at MasterCard. Beth was recognized by Becker's Hospital Review as one of 110 women in med tech to know in 2017. Prior to joining MasterCard, Beth served, served as the Chief Marketing and Product Officer for Health Payment Systems, where she was responsible for the strategic positioning of HPS and led the company's marketing, consumer engagement, and product development efforts. Beth has had, has had over 25 years of experience in the financial services and healthcare technology industries. She has been married to Patrick for 23 years and has two lovely daughters. Welcome, Beth. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, Mary Ellen. Really, I really am thrilled actually to be here um, and to share some insights 
that have been really been invaluable to me over the years. We're really going to start working a professional career with purpose, really being satisfied, loving what we do, even when things don't go the way that we wanted. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to share some research based insights and then share some very practical tools that you can use to enhance your professional purpose. So let's get started. So I'm going to start with a story. Let me tell you about Kate. She's a former colleague of mine. She manages hundreds of employees at one of the top companies in her industry. She's an admired leader with dozens of years of experience, recognized as a rising woman executive by her leadership team. Because her company is wildly profitable, her high six-figure salary is significantly higher than the average for her position. But she never lets it go to her head. Her bragging is limited to talking up her team. She's proud of how they work and support one another. No matter what Kate is talking about, you can tell she's genuinely interested in you. Kate and her husband have two children and a happy marriage. But something's wrong. I just spoke with Kate last week, and that's not her real name, by the way. And she's really not happy right now. Why? I would suggest that Kate has lost her clarity of purpose for her work. And she's not tapping into a ladder of professional support that she could be taking advantage of. So I want to talk about both of these challenges and how they might affect you as we begin this conversation today. And I'll give you a little update on Kate in just a little bit as well. So clarity. Clarity is a critical component, component to high performance. This is really knowing your purpose. So first, it's critical for you to get clarity. You generate clarity by asking questions, researching, accepting new work assignments when offered, asking for new opportunities. Clarity on who you are is associated with overall self-esteem. So why is this so important? Because once you have clarity, you can begin to chart a path to achieve your goals. Research shows that one of the most critical characteristics of success for high performers is clarity. So let's walk through a simple exercise to help you define clarity for yourself. Take out a piece of paper and rate yourself on a scale of one through five, with one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree. I'll give you a minute. Okay, number one, I know who I am. I'm clear about my values, strengths, and weaknesses. Number two, I know what I want. I'm clear about my goals and passions. Number three, I know how to get what I want. I have a plan to achieve my dreams. The higher the scores on questions such as these, the better your overall high performance scores. So I really want you to encourage, I really want to encourage you to seek clarity. I honestly wish we could spend more time on this today, but I really want to share a couple of other things with you. So I can't spend too much more, but I want to recommend Brendan Bouchard's book, High Performance Habits, for some additional insights. And I'll give you some more detail on that in a few minutes or at the end of the presentation, actually. So let's go deeper. Clarity is important. I hope that exercise on clarity helps a little bit, but candidly, for some of you, it made you feel a little uncomfortable. Why? Because maybe you don't have clarity on these things. Or, Perhaps you're thinking about these things of, in terms of who you are, what you want, and how to get what you want in terms of only your work goals. 
Or maybe you think it seems like too self-centered to think about me so much and my goals. Isn't there something more to a satisfying career than achieving my goals at work? Research says, yes, absolutely. So let's go deeper. Beyond simply the work that you do and talk about why you do the work that you do. So why do you work? What is your higher purpose? I'm not talking about making money or achieving some level of secular success. I'm talking about the big picture. Research shows that high performers want to do well to serve a purpose they find meaningful. That's important. I wanna say it again. Research shows that high performers want to do well to serve a purpose they find meaningful. Fulfilling a higher purpose serves as a positive sort of pressure. Even obligations and difficult to meet deadlines, which many people dislike, are viewed as positive performance enhancers. So my point here is that you really need to think beyond what you're doing at work to a bigger purpose that has more meaning for you. Let me just give you an example. So let's go back to Kate. Yes, Kate is successful professionally, but she's a wife, a mother, a cancer survivor, a community leader, a faithful Catholic, and, and more. Her satisfaction in life comes when she's serving others based on authentic values of hard work, family, and faith. I've watched her. She's amazing. She thrives on helping others come together as a team, really almost like a family, supporting each other towards their personal and professional goals. And she mentors and cheers them on and rejoices in their accomplishments. She's never articulated her higher purpose or mission to me specifically, but I would expect that it is centered on her personal and professional growth so that she can serve those around her to become the best they can be. And I know it's based on her faith in God. She has a spiritual perspective in all that she does. It sort of rings through for her. And I would guess that she takes it to another level of purpose in her daily tasks. You can progress the slides on to uh, applying your purpose through daily tasks. Anyway, so anyway, I would guess that she takes it to another level of purpose in her daily tasks. Um, and she's, you know, when she's focusing on a particular project, whether it's getting the house clean at home or getting her leadership team at work aligned to a new goal, she focuses, she really focuses at several levels. One, her work goal. Two, and deeper, the, serve, the purpose of serving her family or her team. And third, and probably more importantly, at her kind of meaning level, or perhaps some would say spiritual level, she focuses on offering her work well done for a particular intention. She, she shared that with me sometimes. You know, maybe she might offer her work for a friend who's working through a job loss or, or the death of a family member. The old adage of offering it up can really become reality when you focus your work activity at this level. Having this extended intention for your work makes a huge difference in how you attack that work. At least that's been my experience. Try it and see how it influences your satisfaction and your results. So we focused on gaining clarity on purpose and we could talk a lot more about it and talk about a lot of meaning, you know, what is meaningful to you and, and you could have much bigger, you know, meaning intentions beyond um, some of the things that my friend Kate has. Big, big, you know, visions of how you want to impact the world. And that's awesome. The key is for you to gain that clarity of purpose. So we focused on gaining the clarity of purpose and how you can take that to deeper levels of service to others and even to a deeper 
meaning level, a deeper spiritual level potentially. But now I'd like to get more tactical and share two high performance habits that I have found to be critical to my success. And that research shows high performers do consistently. Number one, have a morning routine, which Brendan Burchard calls the first hour of joy. I love that. It's really my favorite part of the day now. And number two, establishing your support, your professional support infrastructure. Let's dive into that. You can't contribute and leading to your team or leading change in your organization if you are exhausted, stressed out, and pulling in a million, being pulled in a million different directions. So putting some of these tactics into your day can make a huge difference. Believe me, I know. It's taken years for me to get some of them in, into place. And I continuously, as my life evolves and changes, I have to adjust. Let's dig into some of these and hopefully they can provide some value for you. So that first hour of joy. Most people start their day by rolling out of bed and grabbing their phone to look at emails or scroll through the latest news on social media. Is that you? It's a horrible way to start your day with negative news and email, which is really, think about it, starting your day responding to other people's priorities. Let me say that again. When you start your day with email, you're responding to other people's priorities. How can you expect to get your work done well if you're responding to other people's priorities first? Think about it. Research shows that those who embrace a consistent morning routine have improved energy, confidence, and productivity on a daily basis. And that morning routine is the first thing you do. And it consists of three things, no matter what performance coach you might follow. I've studied many. One, physical, two, spiritual, and three, planning components. And there are some tactical things that I'd like to share with you as well. You'll be amazed at your confidence and improved results just by taking that action of a morning routine. So first, let's talk about the physical part. You wanna get your blood flowing and your body moving in the morning. For those of you that like to work out in the afternoon or evening, that might only mean 10 to 20 minutes of stretching to get that blood flowing. Or it might mean getting on the elliptical or lifting weights for energy and strength if you have more time. But you need to do something to get your body awake. And don't forget about drinking a glass of water. We get dehydrated overnight and we need to replenish fluids, enabling your brain to literally function at a higher level than if it's not fueled. You may need a healthy energy drink or coffee too, but especially after moving, you might be surprised to find you don't need it as much as you used to. For me, I always get about 20 to 30 minutes of cardio workout in, walking outside in this beautiful summer, I love it, or jumping on the elliptical in my basement. So easy to just do it. And then every other day, I work either my upper body or my lower with weights. This is really critical for strength and agility as I age. So at the end, I'd love to hear from some of you about what works for you. No matter what though, in any case, don't skip movement. Second, fuel your soul. Find a specific place in your home where you can sit quietly, ideally without interruption. This might require that you get up 15 minutes earlier than everybody else in your house, but it's worth it. For most, this time includes prayer or meditation or perhaps some spiritual or inspirational reading. It's a time to give thanks and ask for the grace to move through your day with confidence, trusting that you're being supported along the way, along your path. I love this part of my morning. For me, after I get up and brush my teeth and change into my workout clothes, I go downstairs, drink a large glass of water and make some tea. And I sit down into my favorite prayer chair with some meditation time. I do this first 
is it makes getting out of bed easier, candidly, even when I'm really tired, because I know I get to sit and be quiet again soon. Third, planning. Plan. This only means taking five to 15 minutes to look through your day and identify your top three priorities. Note, those top three are the ones you address first in your day. I literally block the first hour of my day to focus on my top priorities. To be honest, I have a more robust planning system I use on Mondays first thing. It's part of my priority time on Mondays to document my weekly goals based on my monthly and annual goals. It's all in a spreadsheet. If you can visualize it, I have a column of my annual goals, which I documented at the beginning of the year. I have monthly goals that I update monthly. And then I have weekly goals that I update weekly. And it's incredibly helpful. I print the weekly goals as kind of a checklist for the week and put it right in front of me on my desk. That way I really never get off track. So this part of my morning routine is really easy. I just look at my day, see the critical meetings and prioritize and priorities for, for me for the day. Um, this review also includes one, who am I waiting on? And two, who do I need to reach out to? So once I get to my desk, I can easily continue with my plan for the day. Let me give you a little professional tip. When you're at your desk and one of your top priorities depends on a response from someone or requires you to reach out to someone sort your inbox by people's names. If you didn't hear from those you were waiting on, move it to like a reach out list. It's a huge time saver and keeps you from scrolling through all of your emails and wasting time responding to things that do not support your priorities for the day. Remember, your top three priorities come first. For me, I block the first hour of my day to, to address those priorities. Sometimes I have to block more time or I have to block time later in the day. But that first hour is for my priorities, not for someone else's. So to recap my morning routine, wake up, brush my teeth, change into my workout clothes, drink a glass of water, make tea, sit down and pray. And then I have a workout cardio and alternating upper or lower body with weights. Then I review my day, usually just looking at my phone, identifying my, my top three priorities. Then I take a shower, get dressed, attend mass, oftentimes if I can, online these days, and then I go to work. I focus the first hour on my priorities, not on my email responses, although I may need to go through this, the sorting exercise I mentioned. And getting this routine in place, honestly, it's taken years of practice and adjusting, and it, it doesn't happen overnight. I get up early to get it all in, usually five o'clock or so. You may have different circumstances than I do. You may have little children. You may have been up at night. You may have a long commute. But figure out what works for you to fit in these three key things into your morning. Don't let these things impact your ability to establish some level of control of your mornings. Don't let the circumstances of your life impact your ability to establish some level of control on your morning. It will make a huge difference in your life. So the morning routine. It's critical, but keep in mind, everyone, everyone's morning routine will be different. Some days, you may only have 15 minutes, but take that time to stretch, sit and close your eyes for five minutes, take the time to identify your top priorities, especially the top three, and that time's gonna serve you all day long. Research shows that you'll be more ready for your day and more content and confident as you move through it. I challenge you to give it a try next week. Last but not least, my last tactical tip. Position yourself for success, for success with a community of advisors. Many people hear that they should have a mentor. I agree, that person is invaluable. 
they're typically a person who is more experienced than you and can provide insights and recommendations to you. Often they're within your company and understand the processes and culture of the company and can be a great resource. But if you really want to take it to another level of competence, staying rooted in your purpose and growing towards your goals, I recommend that you not only have a mentor, but a sponsor and a coach. Why all three? Because they serve different purposes. The mentor, as I discussed, is really a person who ideally is within your company. So someone that you can trust, who's more experienced than you, who you can have confidential conversations with on a regular basis. For me, this is my previous manager. She knows my skills, my strengths and weaknesses. She's supportive and willing to guide me. And I make sure that we meet on a monthly basis. It's on my calendar. I send her a monthly, I send her an invitation that's a recurring meeting and it's, it's fabulous. The second is your sponsor. This is usually a person who can recommend you within your organization for a new role or for a promotion or for perhaps just another opportunity to do something that would augment what you know today. They may be your manager or someone in your line of business that has authority to do so. Honestly, this is a really critical person. For me, this is the head of our global healthcare strategy. He knows what I do, he appreciates my skills and wants to help me grow. Critically and very, very importantly, he sits in the committees that can recommend me for new roles or promotions. And so I make sure that we also meet every other week. And to be candid, we've established such a good relationship that we often talk more often than that. And then third, the coach. This is a person that, you, that can coach you at a deeper level. He or she can work through confidence issues or challenging relationships, challenging projects or problems at work, or perhaps candidly on your personal life that perhaps is impacting your work or other aspects of your life, perhaps even your health. They can support you spiritually and in like a breadth of ways if desired. They often are not associated with your company at all. They often come with a fee which can be negotiated to be paid by, your, paid by your company. I certainly have negotiated that on several occasions. I've had a coach of some type for about 15 years or so, and maybe not coincidentally, I've had one through probably the biggest growth years of my career. I definitely do attribute my growth in part to having this resource. I have a couple of, of resources for coaches that I know personally in the resource section of the PowerPoint. So I'll talk to those at the end of the presentation. So by the way, remember Kate? Well, when I chatted with her last week and she was sharing, sharing her dissatisfaction with work, sort of life in general, candidly, I gave her similar advice. Get a coach and a mentor. She already has a solid sponsor. And I was really to hear though the next day when she updated me that she immediately reached out to a coach I recommended and to an executive leader in her organization to ask if they could connect. And that, that leader responded immediately, almost immediately, I guess, <laughs> with a yes to connecting. So it was really awesome. She, was re she felt empowered just by taking those two actions. But Kate, you know, Kate is recreating that community of advisors. And now I know she will regain her clarity of purpose and the meaning behind her work and overall life satisfaction really soon. I know she's gonna be just fine. So let's try to wrap up on some of the things we've talked about today. So first, take the time to have clarity about your purpose. Think about it at work and how you're serving, what's meaningful to you. And, and then also tactically and how you take action, potentially with a deeper meaningful purpose. Secondly, establish a morning routine that includes physical, spiritual, and planning components. Your routine's gonna be unique to you, but take the time, I promise you, 
it will have a positive impact on your life. And then support your success with a community of advisors. Determine who would be a good mentor, a good sponsor, a good coach. They're critical. Um, it, I, I really can't emphasize it enough. It's something that, candidly for me, it, having all three was a relatively new concept for me um, until a couple of years ago. And I expanded to make sure that I have all three and it's made a huge difference for me and my satisfaction and candidly and the support that I get um, on a day-to-day -day basis in my work. So my challenge to you today is to find at least one thing that I've shared today and make a commitment to try it for one week. Get up 15 to 30 minutes earlier and establish at least some aspect of a morning routine. Identify a mentor, a coach, or a sponsor. Take the time to journal, pray, or in some way get clarity on your purpose. Maybe even offer your work well done tomorrow for a particular person that you really care about who's maybe going through a difficult time. Lots of people are today with everything going on in our society. My wish for you is that you find that your professional work has purpose and that it's satisfying in a deep way. It ser serves a purpose that you find deeply meaningful. On our resources page, the next page, I've included some resources that might be of interest. Brendan Bouchard has uh, studied performance and he actually did a, about a three year study of high performance across many industries to create his book, High Performance Habits. It's incredibly insightful. Um, it, it, you can use it as a workbook. He has all kinds of information on um, you know, YouTube and blogs and lots of great resources, but I just really uh, appreciate some of the very tactical and also just deeply um, meaningful work that he's done. Darren Hardy is also, a, he's a successful entrepreneur, entrepreneur and a coach. Um, he has amazing productivity tips. I love his, I took his insane productivity course a number of years ago and got lots of great tips out of that. Really enjoyed it. Um, Joan Sparks. Joan is a coach in my own community here in Wisconsin. She hosts coaching groups and does individual coaching. I participate in her executive women's group and absolutely love it. And I do individual coaching as well. And then Erin. Erin's a former, ex former executive with Aetna. Um, she was the president of her division and she was a previous client of mine. Um, and she's become a very good friend. She created her own coaching programs, both in groups and individually, um, now with her own company, Be Authentic. She seems to be geared um, towards professionals that seem to have maybe five to 10 years of experience, but she certainly has the experience herself to expand beyond that. She is authentic in her approach, and she's really smart and experienced, but really down to earth. She's just a really, a really neat person. So she could be a fit for some of you, perhaps. I really hope today was valuable and these resources can help you. It's been really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And um, anyway, I hope you take away at least one thing and put it into practice. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Mary Ellen, I'd be happy to take some questions. Great. Wow. I know that if everyone was not muted, they would definitely be applauding you right now, Beth. That was, <laughs> that was fantastic. That was really, really wonderful. You gave, you gave me a lot to think about, which is great. Um, so we do have a few questions um, to start right off the bat. Um, and then just to remind people um, at the bottom, that Q&A little icon, you can definitely submit your questions there. Um, but for starters, Beth, you seem to enjoy studying high performance. Mm -hmm. Are there other high performance habits that you have leveraged in your life that you can share with us? There's a ton of them. Um, well, one tip uh, that I've actually shared with some people um, who may be listening in the past that I just continue to find, you know, repeatedly is so helpful is to block 50 minute increments in my day. So I talked about my morning and having my, you know, the first hour of my day, even when I get to work to focus on my first top 
three priorities. But, you know, of course, we all have projects or initiatives that take more time and you just need to put them in chunks of time. And so one thing I've learned is to block out 50 minute increments because physically, physiologically, mm -hmm. you can't do a whole lot more than 50 minutes of concentrated work without your brain getting tired and your eyes getting tired from looking at the computer screen or whatever it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. So then it's really important to take, you know, five or 10 minutes to break away after that 50 minutes and get some, get some exercise, take a drink of water and close your eyes for a little bit to rejuvenate. That's been huge in, in keeping my energy up throughout the day. Great. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Another sure. question is, um, you seem like an amazing planner, especially with your weekly goals. What advice do you have for someone who might find it difficult to set and, and, and plan goals, particularly if mm -hmm. planning doesn't come naturally to them? Sure. It's really helpful to put some things on paper and I keep it really, really simple. So if there's, you know, if there's it, focus on what are the three top priorities that I have today, even if you're a mom, you're in a home, I need to make sure that I get the laundry done today. I need to make sure that the dishwasher's unloaded. Yeah, good <laughs> I need to make sure, you know, right. I need to make yeah. sure that we get that one class taken care of on the computer with, you know, with my daughter or son. Um, Whatever those priorities are, make sure those are written down mm -hmm. and you're really clear about them and try your best to try to attack them right away at the beginning mm -hmm. of the day. I, I think simplicity is, is critical. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. Another question is you talked about clarity and gave an example, an excellent example on it. Um, would you share your personal passion or purpose with us here tonight? Sure. Well, my personal passions are really about doing my work well for the benefit of others, my company, my colleagues, my team, um, and then being able to offer up those things um, for specific intentions throughout my day. It just gives me more meaning in my day. Mm -hmm. But in a bigger picture, I'm all also really, really passionate about health and having energy. Like, the older I get, the more I need to make sure that I'm conserving my energy and that I'm able to get through a full day of meetings and interactions and historically lots of travel before COVID. And then being able to have the energy to come home and, and be with my family and, mm -hmm. and be able to function. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. so having that balance. So really not only, so doing my work well, but also doing it in an effective, what I think of as balanced way. So being successful, but doing it in a, in a balanced way. And for me, that really means doing the things that I've talked about today, having a morning routine, having a plan, executing on the plan um, so that I can feel like I've accomplished something throughout my day and that mm -hmm. it's satisfying for me because I'm doing it a deeper purpose. Then I have the energy you know, to do what I need to be able to do as things go on. Sure. Great. Awesome. Um, okay. Another attendee from tonight said, I work for the government and the people around me are always busy and seem overworked because of that. I haven't been able to find a mentor. What suggestions mm -hmm. might you have and maybe approaching someone? Sure. So I'd like to think, I, I guess I would, my, the first thing that comes to mind for me is to think, who do you know that you really respect? Mm -hmm. Somebody who maybe is in your field that you think does it really, really well and would be the kind of person that you'd want to be. They may be within your office or perhaps in another office you see them or have had a limited amount of interaction, but, but sometimes they, may, they might be somebody you don't know at all. Um, that maybe you just know of. Maybe they're even somebody that's kind of celebrity that you could you could watch and study online or via podcasts or things like that. Because sometimes, at least for a period of time, you can get some mentoring by just studying someone who's living and operating the way that you want to. And I can think of a lot of, um, a lot of people that 
that I, I listen to podcasts and I follow because I learn something from them all the time. So one way is to do that. But I would continue to look for someone that you could actually interact with, you know, in an interpersonal way um, that could be a mentor to you. And honestly, I, I truly believe that if you, if, you, if you focus on finding someone, someone will come into your life hmm. and you will have a mentor. Great, great, great advice. Um, another question, we'll take a few more. Um, this person says, as a younger professional, she's only five years into the workforce, I work for a manager who has no interest in or time for or ability to help me grow or develop as an employee. Do you think it's important for younger professionals to work for someone who is keen on helping them grow, even to the extent that it might mean switching jobs? I think it really comes down to, do you like the work that you're doing and are you still growing? Because if you're still learning and growing in the role that you have, that may be okay. But then it's gonna be critical for you to find the other resources because sometimes you are gonna have a manager who isn't gonna necessarily be the kind of mentor that or support that you would like to have, mm -hmm. but you can still learn in that role. So, um, you really have to decipher, you know, the, the value of being in that role in the first place and then um, get the benefit that you can from that, but look for other, other um, advisors that you can connect with outside of that person. Great. Um, another question. This person says, thank you so much, Beth. My question is, how do you protect your first hour? Back when you used to go into the office, to focus on your top three priorities. How did you stop mm -hmm. interruptions? Mm -hmm. That's tough. Um, when I used to go into the office, I would literally close my door. Mm -hmm. Now, many of us don't have offices anymore where we can close a door or you're just not in a, in a particular company that, that offers that. So sometimes you just, you have to tell the people around you um, that you're focused. You're on, you know, if somebody comes over and interrupts you, you can literally tell them, would you mind if we disconnect at 10 o'clock or whatever the case might be? Some people, I, some people will actually put up a notice on their cubicle, you know, the side of their cubicle and say, mm -hmm. do not disturb until 10 mm -hmm. o'clock or mm -hmm. I'll be, you could say it more nicely. You could say, <laughs> I'll be available at 10 o'clock, <laughs> right? Those are, those are ways to do it. I mean, you have you certainly block it on your calendar so that nobody ideally will book a meeting online during the time when you know you need to use that time. Got it. That's a great point. You can use that for, you know, husbands and kids too, right? I'll be available Absolutely. in an hour, everyone. <laughs> I know lots of moms that actually will do that. They'll designate a, an area of their, their home where they, they, they're like, I need to have my quiet time. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe in the afternoon mm -hmm. and they'll designate it maybe even as their own, a quiet time for their kids too. And say, you know, this is our, this is our quiet time. You can read, mm -hmm. you can, you know, you can take a little rest, you know, whatever. But this is a time when mommy needs to be allowed to sit here and be quiet. Great. Yeah. Sometimes it's essential, right? It is. It you is. have to recover somehow or you won't have the energy for the rest of your day and for the people around you. Right. And I think um, a lot of women, I mm -hmm. just comment, a lot of women tend to think we're being selfless when we take care of everybody around us first. But the reality is that if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. And you're here. I, I've learned that the hard <laughs> way. <laughs> so uh, words of advice from an older person. <laughs> more seasoned, I like to say. <laughs> yes, more seasoned. Um, another question is, how do you leave work at work? Say you have a really hard time, you know, or you have a, a meeting that, you know, went awry. How do you leave work at work and not have it really, you know, infiltrate into your home life? Mm -hmm. That's tough. I mean, I, I work at home now. And so, you know, I have a whole flight of stairs <laughs> to cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
you know, I guess one of the things I have found is that I will take a short meditation break in the afternoon, mm -hmm. usually about 15 minutes. Sometimes I can get away with a half an hour, but I usually don't take a long lunch. So I feel very justified in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I take that time to close my eyes and be quiet and regenerate. And mm -hmm. I find that if I do regenerate, um, I'm better able to deal with whatever's going on at work that may be challenging. And then I'm able to leave what needs to get done. Another thing that I think can be done is to write down, just sort of to get it out of your mind onto a piece of paper. What's the challenge? What can I do about it? And remember, you only should focus on what you can control. Mm -hmm. And there's many things you can't control. Mm -hmm. So only focus on what you can control. Write down what you might do for those things that you can control the next day and leave it on your desk and go home. Great. Great. Um, and then we'll take, we'll take two more questions. So one is, does the physical activity have to happen in the morning, in your opinion, in your professional opinion? The physical activity, some physical activity has to happen. I was trying to emphasize that. You may not like to do a full, like, you know, big workout in the morning, and that's okay. A lot of people like to do it after work. It is one way to relieve stress, and that's another way to leave work at work and de-stress. Mm -hmm. Um, but you do need to wake up your body in a positive way to get literally to get your brain rehydrated, to get the blood flowing in your body and to get you ready for the day. You need to do at least, you know, at least 10 or 15 minutes of some stretching, um, you know, something to open up your body. So you're ready for the day. You will feel tremendously better. Try it. Great. And then the last question, do you have any recommendations on how to gain clarity on a passion or skill set being intended for work or your personal life? This is probably one of the most difficult things that I have had to work through um, to try to gain a level of clarity and meaning. Um, so I can understand why someone would even ask this question. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I, would, I would journal and I would pick up Brendan Bouchard's book. Okay. I think that he has some really good questions and some means for driving additional clarity. And um, part of that will probably come down to journaling about things that um, really have a positive meaning for you. And, and again, if you have the intention to get that clarity, it will come. Just be patient mm. with yourself. Great. Well, Beth, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful event, such a great presentation. Um, thank you so much again for presenting here tonight, virtually from, from Wisconsin, <laughs> as we're all here in Washington, DC. Um, we are going to pick a winner um, for our door prize. Um, and the winner is Leslie Kanuch, I think is how you say your last name. So I will contact you, Leslie, and we will send you one of the books that Beth recommended on her list. Um, and so that will be great. Um, so thank you everyone again for a wonderful evening. Um, in the follow-up email tomorrow, we will send out um, Beth Griffin's email that she shared with us so that if you have any other questions, um, I know, I think one question just came in, Beth, if you want to, um, or if you could share your yearly, monthly, you know, Excel spreadsheet template, because I think so. Okay. Just what that looks like. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, they would love, you can definitely contact Beth. So thank you so much again. And um, we will be seeing you hopefully next month for the professional soiree. So thank you. Thank you again, Beth, all the way from, from Wisconsin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.